So uh, I told you, Christine from the Netherlands, next time I make toast, I'm totally gonna put on your uh, Dutch hageslach on it. This is history in the making. I can't believe you Dutch people eat this for breakfast. See, that, that makes sense. That just makes sense. Thanks, Christine. So this is Geography More. I haven't done this in a long time. For those of you who don't know, Geography More is when I talk about some of the extra information that didn't quite make it in some of the previous episodes. And in today's episode, we're gonna talk about Benin, Bhutan, and Bolivia. I'm pretty excited, so let's just jump in. <laughs> So one thing about Benin that I didn't really talk too much about was the Kingdom of Dahomey. Dahomey was a kingdom in Africa that pretty much encompassed most of the areas that modern day Benin lies in. This kingdom was very rich and it actually cooperated very well with the Europeans in order to sell them African slaves. In fact, the very last ship that sailed out of Africa bringing slaves left in 1885 from Benin heading out to Brazil. Today there's even a monument called the Door of No Return which is dedicated to the kidnapped slaves throughout all of the centuries of the Atlantic slave trade. They use this flag of an elephant with a crown and they eventually fell to the French Empire in 1904. Now when you go to Benin, make sure you ask people if you can take a picture of them or with them. The reason why is because a lot of the people in the country still adhere to voodoo beliefs in which they believe that if you take a piece of someone's body, then you can use it to cast spells on them and they believe that if you take a picture, it kind of captures the essence of the person so it kind of counts. A lot of the time though, they probably won't mind and especially if it's kids. Now here's the thing, in Benin, summers can be crazy hot, like over 50 degrees Celsius. So it's kind of funny because sometimes when people visit during the colder, wetter seasons, they might find people wearing thick coats and this is because the people here are adapted to really hot weather. So for them, 22 degrees Celsius or like room temperature is considered freezing. Now in Benin, like some other countries in Africa, they have a custom where you can actually buy gas and petroleum at little like street vendors on the side of the road. It's kind of illegal, but technically kind of everybody does it because selling gas legally in Benin is actually kind of expensive. And a lot of the times they just smuggle it from Nigeria and sell it on street stands. Otherwise, some notable places that I didn't mention in the video include the Gandhi Lake Village where houses are on stilts, sometimes referred to as the Venice of Africa, the Royal Palaces of Abome back when Benin was under the Kingdom of Dahomey, the Royal Palace of Porto Novo or King Tofa's Palace, which is now a museum, the Fetish Voodoo Market in Cotonou, and the Grand Marche Market in Dantokpa, and the Uida Museum of History which has numerous sculptures and displays devoted to educate the population on the slave past. See, I find Benin and Togo like the two weird countries of West Africa in a good way because they kind of like really held strong to their indigenous beliefs and that kind of spread throughout the Western world. But anyway, moving on. <laughs> Now Bhutan was a very fun episode to make because many of the viewers didn't really hardly know anything about Bhutan. Now I did mention that Paro Airport is pretty much the only airport in the entire country, let alone the international airport. However, there are only nine selected official people that are allowed to fly airplanes in and out of Bhutan, including the queen's father. This is because flying in and out of the sharp hills and valleys of the Himalayas is incredibly difficult and it really takes a skilled pilot to do it. Now Bhutanese people love archery, it's their national sport and they're really good at it. However, However, they still haven't gotten any medals at the Olympics and even though they're a very mountainous country they still haven't participated in the Winter Olympics yet. They also really like to play a dart game except the target is smaller and the darts are like bigger and lethal. If you go to Bhutan you might find some uh phallic images painted on people's houses. This is just a tradition that goes down through history and it's supposed to be for good luck. So uh, you might see some uh, hoo-hahs on houses. Now Bhutan, just like Korea, every year on New Year's, everybody becomes one more year older, if that makes sense. It doesn't, but it's just the way how it is. Now it's a tradition in Bhutan that if you are offered food, you have to close your mouth and say, meshu meshu. But after three times, you can finally accept the food. Of course, foreigners don't have to do this. They don't expect that. However, if you do it, you might make them laugh and chuckle a little bit. Speaking of which, the national dish is emadachi, a very awesome curry dish with rice and stewed chilies and vegetables with cheese chunks. Keep in mind, Bhutanese cheese chunks. Very different from the cheese we use in the West. Now, the funny thing is Bhutan doesn't measure GDP, they measure gross national happiness. What they do is they calculate and factor in social, health, and environmental happiness amongst the population. And that's kind of like what they report to the UN. I, I guess it kind of works, I don't know. The national flower is the rare Himalayan blue poppy. This flower grows at 3,000 to 5,000 meters in altitude and it blooms only once and then it dies. And finally, the monarchy. This is an interesting one. For centuries, Bhutan was actually under the rule of these guys under the title of Druk Desi, which means dragon leader. It wasn't until 1907 that the current monarchy was actually established under the Wangchuk family. Since then, there have been five kings and 2008 marked the centennial anniversary of the monarchy. I would love to go. Fascinating country. Very obscure. Great country 
country. Moving on. Now Bolivia, I've actually been to Bolivia, so some of these facts are actually things that I personally experienced when I went there, and also some stuff that I looked up. Now in the video, I did mention the llama fetuses that were sold at the witch's market. However, I didn't explain what they were for. According to the indigenous Aymara people, you're supposed to take the llama fetus and bury it in the ground and then build your house over it. Supposedly, they say that gives you good luck. Now, when I went to Bolivia, I went through the Yungas Road, the deadliest road in the world, all the way to the Amazon in a place called Rurunabaque, and then we took a boat down the river, and I noticed what my guide said was that you can actually tell if there are no piranhas in the water if you see the river dolphins. Whenever there's a river dolphin, you know that piranhas are all going to be dispersed and there's not going to be any in the water. In Bolivia and in actually a lot of parts of South America, you actually have to buy your own toilet paper and you have to pay to go to any public bathroom. This fact actually really threw me off guard because I had to go to the bathroom when I was in public. Everybody does. And it's not that expensive. It's only like, I don't know, like 20 cents or something like that in US currency. But it's, it's just frustrating because you always have to pay to use a bathroom and you have to buy your own toilet paper. They don't have any of that stuff. Another funny thing I noticed about Bolivia is that you might find people dressed up as zebras on the street. These people are actually hired to help children cross the road safely and educate pedestrians and drivers about road safety. It's like, oh, okay, that, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Now the Aymara people are like, they have a lot of traditions and customs. One of the craziest ones I think that I should have put in the video but I forgot was the festival of Tinku. It's literally just like a festival where people fight each other. It's a fight club festival. You know, they start off dancing, whatever, and then the women back up and then circle all of the men and then the men just pound each other. It's kind of like a festival to help people vent out all of the stress from the previous year. It's just uh, it's a little extreme. Evo Morales was actually the first indigenous president of the country. And although, yes, there are some controversies behind him, nonetheless, inequality and poverty have actually been reduced since his presidency. Otherwise, some notable sites in Bolivia that I didn't mention include the Valle de las Animas with the needle-like rock formations, the Salvador Dali Desert that looks like a Dali painting, the Palacio de Sal or Salt Palace made up of salt, and the dinosaur dance floor in Sucre with the largest site of dinosaur footprints in the world. I mean essentially what it comes down to is Bolivia is the least sparsely populated country in all of South America so you're gonna get a lot of untapped wilderness and you know uh, outskirt regions. Now I had a lot of fun making these videos because these are all kind of like smaller obscure countries that people don't really pay too much attention to. I mean Benin is not a travel hotspot, Bhutan is hard to get into, and Bolivia is kind of like jealous of the the fact that Peru keeps getting all the attention. And I like putting countries like that in the spotlight. You know, they, they deserve a little moment in the in the in the limelight. So that's it for this episode of Geography More. Thank you for watching and uh, this Friday will be another Fan Friday episode. So stay tuned for that.